exclusive disease. Thank you. One disclosure, I do have a consultant agreement with Endologics. This study is, I'm discussing how we're not supported by Endologics. So a uh, little background, aortofemoral um, occlusive disease or iliac occlusive disease is a uh, long-standing problem, perhaps more prevalent in some parts of this country in particular uh, and Europe um, having to do with smoking. Um, the time-proving uh, surgery or treatment for this, oh, it's not a timer, it's a new problem, is, um, can you take the timing timer off? Uh, the time proven uh, treatment for this is really the aortofemoral bypass, and this has uh, shown us to have excellent results with long uh, term patency. Um, it does, however, have some uh, limitations. It's a big operation, does have some increased hospital length of stay, et cetera. But nonetheless, this is to be considered the gold standard for treatment of aortoiliac occlusive disease. The advent of endovascular technologies, uh, notwithstanding, this uh, location of occlusive disease remains somewhat challenging, especially when we talk about complete occlusions of the distal aorta. Kissing stents, in particular balloons and stents, have uh, long uh, been used for this, this uh, location of occlusive disease, first described in 1985 and then the stents in 1991. But there are limitations here, um, in particular with more complex lesions, particularly involving significant portions of the inferior aorta, that can be a uh, patency that's affected by radial mismatch associated with failure, crossing stent configurations, uh, can also be associated with patency loss. And then, of course, this inevitably raises the bifurcation. So you can see that uh, by putting the stents up into the aorta, you can now uh, create a new bifurcation that can be problematic uh, in the future. The CRAP technique is something that's quite popular in Europe. Uh, in the Netherlands, this has uh, um, uh, been popularized. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have uh, one of the important components of this technique, which is the larger stent, covered stent. But this uses three covered stents to re reduce radial mismatch and essentially recreates uh, a, a neo-aorta in this way. The Endologics AFX stent graft, we all know, is a unibody design. We've just heard about it. Dr. Wu told us about it for small distal aortas. It sits on the aortic bifurcation, relies on columnar strength, uh, columnar um, uh, support. It has sizes ranging from 22 to 28, and is a low profile, can be used percutaneously. I think that auto is on there. Um, it's a low 17 French profile, can be used for percutaneous uh, use, and its role in aorta iliac occlusive disease, however, remains unclear. Advantages for aorta iliac occlusive disease are clear. It preserves the aortic bifurcation. It avoids the possibility of missing a common iliac proximal lesion, perhaps. Um, there's no limb competition in narrow distal aorta. The fabric allows for significant oversizes, uh, as I'll show you, with little wrinkling or infolding. It doesn't preclude future aortic interventions, such as T-var, et cetera. And then the covered stent has this sort of in inherent protective uh, nature to it in cases uh, of potential rush of rupture. So we chose to look at this. This was a multi-center study that we embarked upon. It was uh, in, in the US and in Europe. And um, essentially, we had 91 patients, uh, 10 centers, IRB approved. We looked at non-aneurysmal disease. These were all occlusifications. We looked at demographics, procedural detail, uh, technical success, clinical success, as judged by Rutherford classification and ABIs. And then we had a follow-up of mean 22 months. Here are some of the sites uh, in the Netherlands and in the US. Some patient characteristics are shown here. Um, and then more risk factors or medical history, some of the demographics, et cetera, that we expect with our patient population. Most of these patients were claudicants. There were some critical limb ischemia patients, a mean low uh, resting ABI of 0.57. The TAS classification is sort of granular here. And you can see the majority are TAS D, 82% of these patients TAS D. About a third of these patients were deemed unfit for open repair very relevant as we aim towards minimally invasive. Here's a representative case, sort of the stovepipe aorta, and this is a patient of mine that when you look at the axial, you're somewhat intimidated here. I was a little bit anxious about potentially cracking this. This is a 10 millimeter diameter uh, uh, artery, and uh, I went to Home Depot, bought myself some uh, tubing, and, um, and deployed uh, the AFX on the left and one of the other competitors on the right. You see the infolding that's very um, predictable on the uh, zenith. Uh, whereas the AFX does not tend to have a lot of infolding. That sort of reassured me, and we went ahead and treated this TAS-D lesion with um, an AFX device. There's the 9 millimeter aorta. You can see that I protected the IMA. I was a little concerned about sacrificing that. I was considering snorkeling that if I needed to, but we ended up landing just below the IMA and didn't need to treat that with a stent. 
Zach Arthur uh, practices in, in uh, Texas, which has a lot of smokers, so he sees quite a bit of this, and he was kind enough to give me these slides. He has a nice technique where this is a tasty lesion. He puts a femoral femoral through wire from one to the other groin, thereby marking the aortic bifurcation. This becomes very important, actually, because what we aim to do here is to seat the device on the aortic bifurcation and recreate that aorta. Um, the, uh, the key part of this procedure is also pre-dilatation with balloon uh, to make sure that we're able to deliver the vice safely. Here's another task, the lesion, and you can see the femoral femoral through wire and uh, the completion after uh, molding with kissing uh, balloons at the end. So procedural characteristics, you see this is the time, procedure time and fluoroscopy shown here. General anesthesia is required in the majority of these cases. Technical success 100%. Uh, Non-percutaneous access in roughly two-thirds of patients, and you can see the hospital day of about three days. Some complications that are inevitable here. You see the two groups are the unfit for open surgery, shown on the right, and the other cohort uh, on, in the middle there. And you can see that there is, in fact, um, no difference in complication rate between these two groups, uh, sort of uh, suggesting that the higher-risk patient would benefit uh, nicely by this uh, minimally invasive technique. You did, we did have one death, one uh, 30 day mortality from a thromboembolic event, a patient who had a significant amount of thrombus in the aorta and who embolized to the intestine and the uh, buttock. Um, improvement rather for classification at six months is significant. You can see here 73% and likewise an improvement in ABI shown in the bottom panels. Adjunctive procedures, and this is important because especially as we speak about cost of a procedure, we needed 64% uh, patients uh, required adjunctive procedures, and you can see them here. The majority were planned with the exception of the aortic stent. These were all aortas that despite deployment successfully of the device had um, uh, residual narrowing that we ballooned with a uh, palma stent. You can see here that there were, of course, some surgical adjunctive procedures, the surgical endarterectomy and the bypass shown below. But again, these were the majority of these were planned. How about secondary interventions? These occurred, as you can see, usually at six months to one year. Um, and these were nine patients with sec 16 secondary interventions. You can see that uh, there were a couple of patients that had uh, occlusions requiring uh, um, a thrombectomy, and in one case, a, a stent placement. But you can see, see that freedom from secondary interventions at one year anyway was quite good, 90%. How about patency? Primary, assisted primary and secondary patencies are shown here out to two years, really, with the at risk uh, being meaningful. And you can see there that um, an 88.6% primary patency at two years followed by 97.4 uh, assisted, and then of course 100% secondary patency at two years. So quite promising. Um, there are limitations to this technique. It's a larger profile sheath. <clears throat> it does uh, have a four centimeter main body, and as I pointed out in that one uh, example, a case of mine, uh, you do have to be aware of the collaterals, including the IMA, that you risk sacrificing with that longer body. There's potential for coverage of these collaterals. It does require, of course, a slightly higher level of endovascular skill, and the cost is always an issue. Um, and it depends, of course, upon the procedure being compared and length of stay and all the other uh, sort of intangibles. So in conclusion, there's a high technical success for this uh, um, aorta unibody device. Even in TAS CND lesions, there's a low 30-day mortality and low procedural complication rate. Primary patency of 95 to 100 percent throughout follow-up. Freedom from secondary interventions of 90 percent. And it can be safely combined with adjunctive lower extremity interventions usually planned. Next steps, there's got to be an improvement in design. Clearly, all those stents that we use adjunctively can be avoided if we can try to improve radial strength of the limbs to avoid need for adjunctive stenting. Uh, there's going to be an attention to cost and coding, of course, um, in order to get reimbursed for this procedure. Right now, there's not a good code. Um, there is, um, however, some uh, hope on the horizon. I think in 2018, there will be a code for this. And then ultimately, there's going to be a prospective trial looking at the newly designed, newly engineered uh, device specifically for this indication. Thank you for your attention.